So I would like today to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor John Neely, who is a potter here on campus and who looks at the intersection of art and technology in his work. He started out as a potter when he was in high school, so this has been a lifelong passion of his. And he has spent a number of years of living in and studying uh, the culture, language, and pottery of Japan. And he just returned recently from a sabbatical year spent mostly in China with some time in Japan. And we'll be seeing a lot of the Japanese influences on his work tonight. So I'll turn it right over to John so he can get started. OK. <clears throat> See first if this is working. Can you hear me? OK. Um, no, I heard. Um, now, can I make this work? That's another question. Yes. Um, I am indeed a potter, and I um, take some perverse um, uh, pride in calling myself a, a potter, too. <clears throat> I really like. Um, getting on an airplane somewhere and, and talking to the person next to me and they ask, well, what is it you do? And I say, well, uh, I'm a potter and uh, a university professor. And I usually get blank looks like you can study pottery in the university. Um, and in fact, yes, you can. And so um, I, like I say, I'm first and foremost a potter and then a professor. Um, I've been uh, associated with the art department my entire career, um, the art and, Department of Art and Design, I should say now. Um, and, uh, and yet, I cannot talk about what it is I do without um, talking about science. Science is so um, um, integral to the way I see the world, uh, and in fact, the way I think the world works, um, that I find it difficult to uh, avoid it. And so I think just by presenting what it is that I do, um, the kinds of interests that I've had over the years, I think you might um, gain some insight into how art and science intersect. Um, first off, I'd like you to think about your own lives. And um, for example, when you get up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? What's the first thing you see? Does, does that look familiar? That is um, a piece of iconic domestic ceramics. Think how different our civilization would be without that thrown. You might, uh, might eat breakfast, too. Do you think about the bowl that your uh, oatmeal is in? How about that first cup of coffee? What is it you're drinking from? That's what I'd like you to consider as you listen to what I have to say. Um, it's a long stretch um, from when human beings first uh, picked up clay and picked up earth and figured out that it was clay. That is, it had the, the, the qualities of uh, plasticity and malleability that allowed, it, allowed that ancient person to mold it into some sort of shape. Clay is ubiquitous, and by clay, um, I'm actually indicating a whole lot of different things, but there are a group of minerals um, that have similar kind of characteristics. And uh, as, if I get into the mineralogy of it, it gets really complicated, um, so I want to avoid that. But suffice it to say that some of these minerals, um, illite, haloisite, kaolinite, those kinds of things, are around us everywhere. And, the example that I use uh, most often is kaolinite, which in fact makes up 
the bulk of the kinds of uh, clay minerals that we use. Um, understanding what that material is, how it behaves, um, is how we make progress in this field of ceramics. And the one um, thing I'm going to point out this evening using text is how common clay is, how common the elements of ceramics are. This is um, a graph uh, arranged by weight of the eight elements that are most common in the Earth's crust. Far and away, oxygen is the has the greatest share, but then silicon and aluminum. Those things don't exist, though, uh, in nature, or in nature they're very rare as, as uh, discrete elements. In fact, they're usually in oxide form. And so if you take, for example, silicon, dioxide, the most common mineral on Earth, followed by alumina, which is aluminum oxide, Al2O3, Right there is the description of kaolin. It just so happens that in the crystal there's some water too, um, which is oxygen. And I think the, the ninth one down there would be titanium, and the tenth is hydrogen. So basically, we've covered almost all of ceramic materials with that little chart there. We do, in fact, see a lot of iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, and magnesium. And inevitably, that will come up as I talk a little more here. Just keep that in mind that you're talking about really common stuff. Our forefathers, foremothers, didn't understand it this way, though. They understood it experientially. And so they uh, were in... Um, in a position where they had to choose materials on the way they behaved. And <clears throat> this is uh, an example of, uh, this is Maria Martinez, who's one of the most famous uh, potters in the United States, who's well represented, by the way, in the Nora Eccles Harrison Museum of Art collection. Um, she was building on a, on a tradition, a Pueblo tradition that, um, had a very sophisticated understanding of the way clay behaves. Fundamentally, the way they fired things, the way they make this ceramics hard, is to pile it on the ground and put some sort of fuel over the top of it, light it a fire like that. This is actually a recreation of uh, Anasazi firing. Every, every year down in, in uh, Four Corners area, they do a, uh, uh, a pottery event um, uh, where they do a lot of this kind of historical or archeological re um, recreation. Um, but this is a simple bonfire that has pots in it. They're heated slowly. That, first slide, and then wood's piled over it, and then this is back to uh, Maria. Um, as it cools, you can, the result can be something as sophisticated as this beautiful pot by Maria. It's true, this kind of firing is all over the world. We, the Southwest certainly doesn't have a, a, a lock on it. It is, you'll find it all over the world, at least historically. Um, and at all different scales, the same kind of technology, though. The next kind of development was to enclose that fire just a little bit, to build a ring around it, to uh, control the, uh, the way that air and fuel combine. And this gets into chemistry again. The, the chemistry of combustion is really important for what we do, because when you have a proper balance of um, of fuel and oxygen, you get the maximum amount of heat out of, the, out of that fuel. 
finding a way to contain that then becomes the science of, of uh, refractories and insulation. And that's also uh, technology that's really important to potters. So uh, it turns out that the Anasazi actually did have kilns that were dug into the ground. They call them trench kilns, or they do now. Um, that helped control the heat and more importantly, helped control the way the air went through the fire. And they too made some very sophisticated pottery. The next kind of development that you see all through um, Europe, the Middle East, China, um, is a, um, a direct kind of um, uh, development from that last uh, slide I showed you. But what it amounts to is the pots are piled over an open space, a firebox. It's a place to contain the, um, the fuel. And there is a fire mouth that allows air to go in, as fuel as well, to go in. Then the fire burns up. And remember that hot gases rise, right? That's physics. Um, and the heat is carried through the setting in, the, in, the, uh, in this primitive kiln. I've always called this a Roman kiln. Uh, and I think you'll see in a lot of the literature they call it a Roman kiln. But in fact, it is lots of other places. Uh, and before it was in Rome, it, um, it shows up, uh, like I said, throughout the world. And I think there's a, a kind of, um, well, the one, the example that most of you would, might know is that of Greek pottery. That's um, red on black, black on red, red, black on white, those three combinations. Those are all um, Greek, um, they call, call it terra sigillata, but it is, um, that surface on there is generated by uh, the use of colored clay, clay that is colored with iron. Um, and carefully, con it's, um, uh, the state of that iron is very carefully con uh, controlled. I'll talk more about that later, but I want to go back to my own kind of personal investigation. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I went to Japan when I was 19 years old, and I stayed for about the next 10 years, uh, and was studying primarily pottery, although um, inevitably um, you end up picking other, up other kinds of information in the course of, of studying pottery. Um, I include this too to show that I once had hair. <clears throat> Initially, I was enthralled with blue and white porcelain and um, spent a lot of time working on uh, the technique of doing blue and white porcelain, like this one. This is a little bowl that's about four inches in diameter, so you can gauge kind of my obsessive compulsive nature in doing this decoration here. Of course, being in Japan, I had to learn about the history of Japanese ceramics. And if you go way back, it starts with what they call Jomon culture. Jomon means cord marked because a lot of the pottery from that time was um, marked with um, braided cords that were rolled across the surface. But they also did things that were far more elaborate, like this one. This is um, kind of classic Jomon pottery. And um, this dates from about. Uh, 15,000 years ago, 15,000 years before the present era. Um, it was fired in one of those open bonfires, as far as we, as far as we know. And of course, just like that Southwest um, uh, recreation that I showed you a minute ago, they're doing that in Japan too, to try and figure out exactly how this stuff was done. But it's, it seems uh, quite evident that it was fired in open bonfires. The next kind of development in the history of Japanese ceramics that is known as yayoi um, 
a big change culturally in the, in, um, the way the people lived and also in the, in the kinds of things they made. Much more kind of straightforward, utilitarian, if you will, um, but still fired in open bonfires, perhaps with that ring around there to control the fire a little more. They too, though, came up with some pretty sophisticated looking pottery. I think this would work really well uh, in any modern uh, kind of setting, especially that one. It's just gorgeous, I think. Um, along about um, 1,500 years ago, maybe a little longer, um, new technology, though, came to Japan from the Korean Peninsula. In, in point of fact, it actually came from China originally, through the, the um, Korean Peninsula and then to Japan, uh, for a new design kiln. And what happens is you see um, the color changes. You see a lot more of this kind of dense gray color. And it is much harder. That word dense is important here because if you were to tap this, it would ring. Whereas the earlier pots, which were not fired to such a high temperature, um, would go thunk, 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 like an earthenware flower pot. I should point out, too, um, that we, in ceramics, we don't call it baking. We call it firing. And it's not an oven. It's a kiln. Um, it's semantics. but. It's, it's important that you understand what it is I'm talking about. So this was that uh, technological development that I was talking about. And this was simply a hole dug into the side of the hill with a chimney hole going up to the top, fire mouth at the bottom. Now this is similar to what we saw, what I called the Roman kiln, but it um, is different in that the, f the flame is going through the ware instead of, uh, through sideways instead of coming up from underneath it. And it is predicated on having draft that's created by that chimney. That is to say, the, the hot gases go through the pottery and as they um, are expanding, they go up out that chimney. That creates more draft to draw more air in to burn the fuel. Well, because of this, they were able to achieve much higher temperatures. We estimate that the, the um, Yayoi stuff that I showed you a minute ago, um, that was fired at somewhere between 800 and 900 degrees uh, centigrade. Um, the, um, this technology allowed them to achieve temperatures of 1200 or even 1300 degrees. Here's one of those um, kilns in action. Basically, it doesn't look like much because all the action's going on inside. Um, these are the kinds of pots that were coming out. This is known as sueki in Japanese. It marks that kind of period of, uh, of time um, and is a really important development in, in Japanese technology. These ring, and they also, if you look on the shoulder of the pot, there starts to be a dusting of something on there that is fused on. I should point out, too, that when I started in investigating this, I hadn't seen black pots like this, and in, nor had I ever made any that were black like this, and I didn't really know what was going on. And I was speculating about what it is that they were using for colorant. It felt, um, it felt dense like porcelain, but it, it didn't, uh, didn't have the color that we associate with porcelain. There are plenty of examples, too, of, of where the um, surface is completely covered with the byproducts of combustion, which is, of course, wood ash. And wood ash by itself um, doesn't melt very readily in most cases. Um, it happens to be made up of, primarily, of um, 
calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium. Actually, it's the oxides of those things. Um, but uh, that combination by itself doesn't readily melt. It takes the addition of silica and alumina. Remember I mentioned earlier that that's primarily that kaolin um, is silica and alumina. And as soon as that wood ash can react with the alumina and silica, then all of a sudden it makes glass. That's what we got going on here. It is, um, initially we had just sintering of that ash, and then as it combines with the clay and spends more time at, at high temperature, it develops into something that is really a, a glass. And you see that drip running down the side. Well, that is the beginning of glaze technology. That's where glazes come from. Some of them got quite um, thoroughly covered uh, with that fine uh, glazed-like surface. I should point out, too, that in, in the process of combustion, not only is it wood ash, <coughs> excuse me, that um, um, is, results from combustion, but there's also um, a certain amount of alkaline vapor. That is, the, the uh, sodium and the potassium go through the kiln not as uh, particulate matter, but rather as a, as a vapor. Um, that also reacts very readily with the alumina and the silica in the clay to form glass. At some point, somewhere along about um, a thousand years ago, somewhere, um, some potter thought, well, seeing this and realizing that this um, phenomenon existed, thought, well, if clay and ash make this shiny stuff, maybe I can mix clay and ash and put it all over the pot and fire it and get that shiny stuff all over the pots. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. So along about 1100, um, that's glaze technology. That's where it came from. I want to go back, though, to, those, to the, uh, the black business. I'd sorted out a little bit in my mind about where glazes came from, but I certainly didn't know where this black stuff came from. And it was in, in researching a little more about um, the um, Korean antecedents, the, 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 the pottery that was made in Korea, that gave rise to this technology in, in, in Japan, that's when the, the, uh, the light bulb went on uh, for me. Because you look at the Korean pots, they're black the same way. They have sintered ash and, and kind of uh, proto-glaze on the surface. This is a, a national treasure in Korea. Um, from the Silla dynasty, that is the there were, well, without going into Korean history too much, um, the, the um, Korean peninsula was divided into three kingdoms, but all three of them were producing these uh, kinds of, of pots. It had been, it's been recreated since then in, in Korea, and I've got a, a series of, of uh, slides to illustrate that just a little bit, but I can remember vividly sit, standing in Kinokuniya bookstore in Kobe, Japan, reading a book about Korean ar um, archaeology, and that said in there that the, um, this one book said that they were doing excavations on these old, this old kiln site, and the kiln still had unburned fuel in the firebox. And that was the, that was the clue for me to figure out what was going on here, because it meant that, well, in my experience, um, any fuel, any wood that's left um, at the end of a firing burns immediately because air rushes in and consumes it, especially when the temperature is high. It does not stay in an unburned state unless you go to great lengths to quench it or douse it or um, 
cut off all the air. So what they were doing was to consciously seal fuel into the kiln and let it cool in that state. Then I thought, aha, this is, this is um, uh, using the atmosphere in the kiln to change the clay. Now I mentioned earlier that clay has, is mostly alumina and silica. Um, and there is um, a little bit of those other um, oxides in there as well. But there is often iron in there. And we, iron uh, tends to um, go towards red iron oxide. You all know what that is, right? That's rust. It's the color of my old truck. Um, it should be familiar. I'm, I'm not sure. I used to use um, cast iron pans as the example of black iron oxide, but I'm not so sure that they're so common anymore. <laughs> um, but anyway, iron, uh, when it is, uh, when oxygen is taken away from it, you, you can go through three states of red iron oxide, black iron oxide, metallic iron. There's actually a few others in there too, but um, you can get a chemistry teacher to explain that. Uh, <laughs> um, what had happened was there is iron in this clay that they were using in Korea, and they had, by putting excess fuel into the kiln, they had stolen oxygen away from it, from the red iron oxide that was in the clay and turned it to black iron oxide. So these pots that we saw were colored by black iron oxide. This is just loading the kiln, then firing it for days uh, until it reaches a, a high temperature. This is yellow heat pushing white heat. And at the very end, they stuff it full of fuel. And then they seal the whole kiln. We, we usually call it clamming the kiln, right? I don't know why. But, um, Anywhere there is a wisp of smoke coming out, another handful of mud goes onto the, onto the surface. <clears throat> Trapping all that excess fuel in there. And, that, and it, it, that is responsible for changing the color of the clay from red to black. That's the cooling kiln. And that's the pots that came out of it. Well. I went back and started working on this myself. I took red clay. It had um, about 3.5% of red iron oxide in it. Not that I'd added to that. Um, it's naturally occurring clay that includes about 3.5% of red iron oxide, which is enough to make red clay. I think you've all seen flower pots that are this reddish-orange color. I should point out that potters, to potters, um, red is a little bit broader category than it is to many people. We call anything that is brown, orange, <laughs> pink, that's all red. But it is, in fact, all um, stemming from red iron oxide. So I took and made pots from that kind of clay and fired it using excess fuel in both the during while the kiln was going up and while the kiln was going down. And lo and behold, that red iron oxide in the clay was turned to black iron oxide and I had black pots. Of course, depending on how much iron is in there, you can control the, uh, the degree of, of blackness. So there's a whole range that, from white to black with gray in the middle. It also works in uh, very interesting ways with glazes. Now I haven't talked about glazes except to say that um, wood ash and clay will make a glaze. But there are other combinations and other sources of uh, minerals that we use frequently for making glazes. And this is a really simple glaze that's based on um, straw ash or rice hull ash that happens to be very high in silica uh, and feldspar. Feldspar is another very commonly occurring mineral. Um, 
And so that uh, feldspar and the straw ash make a glaze that looks like that. But what's interesting in this case is changing the atmosphere of the kiln as it fires and cools um, changes the nature of the glaze. And there are lots of, lots of examples and an infinite number of uh, uh, variations that are possible on this. So um, I think at this point I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and talk about another aspect of this. You know, I talked about that um, technology that came from Korea to, um, to Japan, that sideways kiln, the cave kiln, which in Japanese is called anagama. Um, that, um, there's been a fad or a, a boom in anagama building. It started, um, actually started before World War II in Japan, but after World War II, um, it really took off in Japan, and by the 60s, it had taken, started to take off in the United States. And now, if you Google that word, anagama, A-N-A-G-A-M-A, -A, you'll find countless examples uh, of it. Um, and I think it's driven by a, um, several different things. I mean, there's a kind of nostalgia going on, or um, <clears throat> longing, I guess, for ancient... Um, ancient technology, ancient um, knowledge. Um, but there's also um, an interest in appropriate technology. Potters are realizing that fossil fuels will not last forever, that um, biomass is probably our, uh, our best bet right now, although I do know people that are firing with you know, solar kilns, and, and um, there are other options is what I'm saying. But part of that the boom in wood firing and in these recreations of these old um, anagama style kilns um, is generated, uh, well, by those diverse kinds of um, uh, reasons. I want you to look at a few images here and tell me <clears throat> what they share in common. It's not very subtle, is it? There's a really good reason that this technology died out in Japan uh, in about the 6th or 7th century. It's grossly inefficient. It uses um, massive amounts of wood. Mountains of wood. And it puts black smoke into the atmosphere. And so um, as much as I find the, the, those ancient pots attractive, and I do find them attractive, um, I, ha I have reservations about doing it in the same way that um, the ancient potters did it. And so uh, some 30 years ago, I came up with a, another way of, of building a kiln, which has come to be known as the train kiln, it looks something like this in, in simple diagram. Um, and what it did, what I did was to take and put the firebox, that is that's where it's labeled stoke up there, up high, put air uh, controls above that stoke hole, uh, and um, then put air holes through a set of steps on the bottom so that we have um, we can have very fine control of the amount of air that goes into it. This is, um, fundamentally, this is like a building a burner. Uh, it works kind of like a, um, well, like a, a Bunsen burner, a Fisher burner. Um, but it allows us to, to much more efficiently extract heat from the fuel, and it also, as it turns out, um, burns cleanly and allows us to achieve results not unlike those pots from ancient Japan, China, um, without the extravagant outlay of uh, fuel. So this is, uh, we right now have uh, four, I guess, train kilns on campus. Uh, one has yet to be fired, it's still uh, waiting its inaugural firing. Um, but 
uh, this is the largest of them, uh, and you, this is um, loading, so you can see the side door is still open, but this is firing, and what I want you to notice is there's no black smoke coming out of the chimney. Oop. Same deal. And so just a couple pots um, that have come out of that kiln, and I'll point out that these two, this is just the color of clay fired in the kiln. There's no applied glaze on there. It's just clay reacting with the atmosphere and the, uh, uh, the byproducts of wood combustion to form that kind of surface. And that's the same thing. We've been doing a lot of um, experimentation uh, with this process over the last 30 years. And uh, my colleague, Dan Murphy, along with the students here, um, have, uh, especially over the past year, in my, while I was on sabbatical, in my absence, they've continued this uh, in earnest. And um, there's a lot more, uh, I think, research to, to be done in figuring out what goes on uh, when wood reacts with clay. So that's what I have for you. Thank you very much. Now, I would ask for questions. It, it depends. Um, this, that, that kiln, I, what's that? Oh yes, how long does it take to fire ceramics was the question. Um, and the answer is complicated because depending on the clay you use, and depending on the kiln you use, it can range anywhere from, um, well, at the short end, it's 20 or 30 minutes. They, they fire wall tile uh, in 30 minutes uh, to some of these big um, Anagama-style kilns will fire, fire for 10 or 14 days. In an extreme case, there's a... Um, a famous potter in Japan named Moritogaku who fired for two months. And that was partly in, re in recreating um, the kilns, uh, the ancient kilns uh, from the Bizen area of Japan. And their speculation is that those were also fired uh, for that amount of time. And that's also why that whole area was denuded of forests. Any other? Yeah. Pardon? Out of the compartment. Oh, well, um, if you, ha if you uh, <laughs> I've not done it, but if you were to burn with um, pure oxygen, um, you, you'd have the equivalent of a, you know what an oxycetylene um, cutting torch is like? Oxygen and, and fuel, if it's pure oxygen, it burns really fast. So you could um, make a really hot, clean flame uh, if you had the balance between the, the fuel and the, and, the, and the oxygen just right with no nitrogen there. Yeah. How many things have I made? Oh, God. Um, myriad. <laughs> I, I've made, first off, I'll say I've made lots of mistakes. And from that has come some successes. Yeah, up there. Yes. All the time. I'll say this though, I like to use other people's pottery. It's kind of like um, just using my own pottery is kind of like talking to myself. Uh, and 
whereas if I can use a plot that's made by one of my friends, one of my colleagues, one of my students, it's like having a conversation. It's a little more fun. Any other questions? Yeah. It, de it depends. I mean, the, um, um, he's asking what temp what temperature do? Well, we, the what conditions do you need in the kiln uh, in terms of atmosphere, right? There are, um, and there are different ways of firing, so you get different results, and so. For example, the difference between the red pots and the black pots was the difference in the atmosphere. The, the material's exactly the same. And so, um, but if I were to use a different material, it might uh, actually, we call it maturing, but it's at the point at which the, the, um, the glass in the clay has, well, I need to back up and explain that more, but um, suffice it to say, <laughs> that depending on the material, uh, you can change the atmospheric conditions. And throughout the firing and cooling, you change it at different times during the, the, the firing and the cooling. Does that answer it? I mean, it's, it's, it all depends. <laughs> yeah. Without glaze? Well, that's what I was trying to explain there. By controlling the amount of fuel and the amount of oxygen in the kiln, I can change the iron in the clay from red iron oxide to black iron oxide. Yeah. What are glazes made of? Are glazes made of? Well, I showed you pictures of ones that were made of um, wood ash and clay, and wood ash and feldspar. Oh, well, colors, there are, <laughs> this is a big field, but um, you know, uh, if you go further down that list of, of elements that are in the Earth's crust, there are a bunch of metallic oxides, cobalt, manganese, um, chrome, uh, and actually those are the common ones. They're much rarer ones too. They all um, will influence the color uh, of, the, of a glaze. And so by putting in very small amounts, you can change the color. Um, I'll give you uh, a, a common example. Um, actually, window glass clear as you look through it, but if you look at it on edge, it's kind of green. It's the same color as a Coke bottle, right? That's because there's iron in the glass. It's the iron that's coloring it. That's black iron oxide that's giving it that cast. Um, if you, um, you know, if you were to put copper, in, well, copper is a complicated one, but copper um, can color it uh, blue or red. Uh, and it's different when you see through it than when it's re lights reflected from it. Um, then there are a whole bunch of um, oh combinations of, of um, well combinations of materials that give other kinds of of colors. Yeah, it's complicated, but yeah. Mm -hmm. If you put in red clay, it will come out either red, gray, or black. I suppose it could also be brown, depending on how you fire it. Yeah. Yep. The, yeah, the, the train kiln started, uh, it was actually a, 
a faculty research grant in 1988, um, I think the first one ever in the art department, uh, that allowed me to build the first, the first one. It is now literally uh, all around the world. There's none in the Arctic or Antarctic that I know of, but uh, um, every other continent, uh, there are train kilns now. And yes, there have been all kinds of developments. And um, uh, case in point is this as yet unfired um, new kiln we have, which is a, uh, a new hybrid design. Uh, I think there are all kinds of developments that are happening, but they still use the same basic principle of a high firebox. So we call it a downdraft firebox and multiple air um, sources. Way up in the back. Well, <laughs> at this point I might say inertia, but um, um, you know, the, the, the real thing is every day, every time I sit down to eat, I think about pottery because I'm using it. It's, um, it's just impossible for me to forget. Does that answer it? Okay. Sure, Jan. Oh. <laughs> How many ways are there to fail? <laughs> uh, certainly, it is not. Um, it's not. Uh, Entirely predictable, we'll say. It also depends on what you attempt to do. Um, the the um, the really simple things. It, there are, for example, an electric kiln using um, standard glazes and standard clay. We can make pretty predictable, but it's usually not as um, as interesting. It's not as um, Part of the, of the joy of it, I guess, is the gamble. And so, the, for example, that last, those last little dishes that are up there, I couldn't have told you how they were going to turn out. I know what the, what the parameters are. I know what the possible results are. But I couldn't have predicted that it would make that particular pattern and have that particular um, uh, arrangement of color. So I guess I continually go towards the things that are not entirely predictable or reliable, all the while wanting to have control. So there's a little bit of um, paradox there. What's that? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, to metallic iron? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what a Bessemer furnace is. I mean, you know, a, 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 if you're uh, taking iron ore and making it into iron, yes. Heat and atmosphere, yes. Hi there. <laughs> the next one. <laughs> Way up in the back. Um, everything in science, everything in art, and then literature and <laughs> You know, I think, I think that um, uh, history, certainly, and um, I, I ha I'd be remiss if I didn't say that in my entire education, the best thing I did was to learn a foreign language. So I'd have to recommend that, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Both. Yeah, it's, it seems that um, it did arise spontaneously in different places, uh, but there's also a tremendous amount of evidence of um, migration or somehow communication. Green. A bisque fire and what? Well, no, a bisque firing is a preliminary firing. Um, it comes out looking like a biscuit. It doesn't look like a finished cake. Um, it's a bisque firing that is preliminary to firing another time, a, a glaze firing usually, at a higher temperature. Yeah. Cone number that I've fired at? About cone 14. I've seen it in, you know, in, in um, uh, Cones, he asked, what's the, what's the highest cone number I've fired to? Cones are, pyrometric cones are um, fixed compositions of um, minerals mixed together and made into a little cone that will melt at a particular temperature. And we use those to say, for example, um, uh, cone 10 melts at uh, 1,280 degrees, roughly. It's more complicated than that, but roughly. Um, and typically we fire, that's the range we fire in. But I've just come from China where we were firing uh, at more like 1400 degrees, which is cone 14, cone 15, somewhere around there. Yeah, one, uh, we, one we should, more. yeah, one more. I would say now it is um, the World Wide Web that spreads that information. But um, historically or prehistorically, I don't really know. Well, let's thank John.